Major funding for these programs is made possible by grants from Capital One Bank, New York Community Bank, Eastern Consolidated, M&T Bank, Customers Bank, Meridian Capital Group, Terra CRG, The Wickoff Group, Perfect Building Maintenance, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chase Commercial Mortgage Lending, Aerial Property Advisors, Genova Burns. Additional support is made possible by AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, AmTrust Title, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Leumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Citizens Bank, Connect One Bank, Colliers International NYC, Collins Building Services, CPEX Real Estate Services, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Fisher Brothers, Flushing Bank, Friedman, LLP, Hendler Real Estate Organization, Hersha Hospitality, HAP, Investment Developers, Hodges Ward Elliott, Inc., Investors Bank, iFunding, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Madison Realty Capital, Matone Group, Mercantile Commerce Bank, New Banks, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Pulsinelli, Rosewood Realty Services, SJP Properties, Sterling National Bank, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, The Continuum Company, The Knackle Group at Cushman and Wakefield, The Meringoff Family Foundation, The Moynian Group, and These Friends. Manja. That's all people want to do is they want to eat. They want to eat all over. They want to eat steaks. They want to eat Japanese. They want to eat French. They want to eat Italian, American. And then they want to eat barbecue. So today, due to the help of my buddy, my executive producer, the man who takes over the show normally, Drew Naporin. Thank you. We've, he has assembled a group of dynamic restaurant people to discuss the current trends and the state of the restaurant. My guests are from Canada. Yeah, yeah. Canada, Originally, yeah. you're a yeah, Canadian. Yeah. You Canadian. Def- uh, Canadian, you defour of M. Wells Steakhouse and M. Wells Dinette. Dinette. From yeah. the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia, Joey Campanero, who is the Little Al, Market Table, and the Clam, also in the, in the, in the sauce business. From Brooklyn, New York, number one barbecue in the city of New York, in Red Hook, Bill Durney. And last but not least, the kid who grew up across the street from Stuyvesant Town, the, the famous proprietor, not the chef, the owner of Tribeca Grill, the Tard, okay, you have the hamburger place today, yeah. Nobu, and the legendary Drew Naporin. Michael, you tasked me to do a slightly different show than we normally do. And um, going outside of Manhattan, you know, and I'm basically, when, when you say New Wait, York you, restaurants, you, I say you, Manhattan, you know. See, I said to, uh, to Bill, he's planning to do something in Staten Island. Did he get a... Where's uh, Staten Island? That's right, Staten Island, okay? You know? Oh, I yes, went on the ferry once. Yes, we my passport. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So, no, no, but uh, the, the, the great news in New York is that it's now a, a great food mecca for all the boroughs because of these gentlemen. Um, this, this generation has really made it um, worthwhile to go outside of Manhattan and to visit, you know, Brooklyn, Queens, Staten Island, I guess. The village is... Outside. Well, Campanero and I, we know each other a long time, and, but he, uh, he's had the little owl for 10 years now. And, uh, Market table for nine and the clam. Right, and the clam is doing great, I know that. And then he, he also made the mistake of going to Philadelphia. <laughs> See, the show's really go someplace within the five boroughs, but... Uh, yeah, but we have, the, we have the, the Canadian over here who learned the ultimate problem of a restaurant. 
getting screwed by your landlord. Uh-huh. Okay? Yeah. You know, you went in, you didn't understand, you put money into the place, and then what happened after a year? I mean, like, I, I have, like, I have, we have to say that I have very little to lose to, to begin with. I have no name for myself. Just moving down here with my wife, we were serving, like, we had a plan of serving, like, commuters breakfast in the morning. So we didn't expect too much. Uh, a little bit of money, a little bit of <laughs> a few credit cards. But, uh, yeah, but I what mean, was landlord. It? That was, this place, this place was an old diner. Uh, diner that was, uh, I, w- I happened to live uh, right across the street, kitty, co- uh, kitty corner from, uh, from that diner, and um, it was always empty. And uh, at the time, I was still living in Montreal, dating my wife, and uh, my, my wife wasn't my wife. But, uh, <laughs> That's usually and I would come, and I was like, oh, a new tenant. And then I'd come back a week later, and oh, this tenant is gone. And I was like, <laughs> it was mysterious, but a beautiful diner made in Jersey, St. Gack, and like the whole thing. And um, yeah, we we're looking for a place, and there was, there was no, <clears throat> no big deal to... Uh, uh, this place, at some point, this place was... was they had three liquor licenses within the same premise. Uh, they, had, uh, they had a Chinese takeout inside, uh, a Spanish deli, uh, and a bar, just like for the commuters for the Long Island Railroad. Like wow. you take one beer to stay, one beer to go. And uh, so that was it, uh, you know. And, and now you the landlord, we had to chase the so landlord. So now you made it a, uh, a Michelin star steakhouse? Yeah, yeah. The steakhouse is a, it's a new venture, but at the time I had a Michelin, Given uh, a Michelin star uh, at the diner, but I was closing, so I had to uh, I had to send it. But back. who discovered you? One of the who who would you say put you on the map? <clears throat> I had a friend uh, that was writing for the New York Times at the time that just like thought it was good to write a story, but I knew him from Montreal. The outer boroughs were always, uh, you know, Arthur Avenue was one a separate thing, in a different market, and people would go to other places, you know. For Italian food, you wanted to go, you, you went to Parkside, because everybody knew there was Parkside, it was a great place. People yeah. only knew you could be in Manhattan. Manhattan was the place you couldn't even be in the West Village. You could, it was in a different market. How did you decide to go over there? Well, I was working in uh, Tribeca at the time. Um, and before Tribeca, I lived in Los Angeles. And I said, you know, I'd lived in New York. I don't. If I go back to New York, I don't want to be in, like, typical New York. I wanted to feel not New York. So I ended up in Tribeca. And then the only other place that I felt like wasn't very New York with like loud honking horns and people rushing to get to work was in Greenwich Village. And um, my ex-wife, Paula, at the time, she she saw this space and she said, "Um, call this number and, and take the and try and get this place. And I said, yeah, I'll do it tomorrow. And she said, no, call it right now. And we got into a fight over it, and I was like, please, just stop breaking him for me. I want to go to sleep. I'm tired. I was in a little bit of a depression. And she said, Joey, call this number right now. And I called it, and I actually spoke to someone at 11 o'clock at night. Wow. And then I went to go see the place the next day, and I submitted a, a business plan, one of 100 business plans to the landlord, and the landlord chose us. That's great. Now, how do you, a former security guy who had your own uh, private security agency, decide to get into the barbecue i'm insane i'm totally <laughs> insane uh no i mean for me it was it was when i would try i, I knew you <clears throat> like to carry the logs you know, <laughs> right for a little weightlifting. <laughs> <laughs> for me uh, for me it was about traveling you know i got to see a lot of the world when i was um looking after a lot of protectees around the world i mean that's actually how i met joey randomly one of my protectees lived on the a uh, block of Little Owl, and I would see him out there, like he just said in, before we went on air, in the bloody apron, and you know uh, he was there. What impressed me as as a non restaurateur at the time was the fact that he was there all day, all night. Then he'd cook for service, and then I'd see him outside. So I think instinctively, even back then, I was thinking about like what that work ethic meant. You know, I was working 17, 18 hours a day in the protection community. Um, and then I would see someone like him delivering such a crazy product. Um, and it was all the example of all the hard work he was putting in. He doesn't know any of this that I'm saying about, right. but that's how I, I felt at the time. I was like, wow, that's, that's interesting. But, but for me, it was traveling, seeing people in South America, seeing the gauchos cook over wood fires, you know, hand spinning live animals, uh, 
you know, it was not live, but uh, I had cooking, no, no, but cooking you, animals you in front of me live. It's in your biography that your grandparents originally came to Red Hook and you were a Brooklyn boy anyway. But Red Hook didn't have any restaurants, okay? Yeah, you know, the, they had a the couple. Vill the village had a small number of restaurants, a unique number. You know, when you talk about Tribeca, the, the guy who really established Tribeca is uh, my yeah. buddy over here when he found it when he was racing in the marathon. When I was running, yes. Running in the no, marathon. You know, Michael, there's a lot of similarities. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of similarities because, I mean, my first restaurant I opened in 1985, 31 years ago, and it was a restaurant I could afford. And the outer boroughs, the theory anyway, uh, would have been someone's going to set up shop in an outer borough because the rent is so uh, comfortable, reasonable, reasonable then, and, and if they hit a home run, well, these guys didn't just hit a home run. I mean, it's like the notoriety that happens, and you know, it feels like it happens right away, but you have to work at it. Obviously, it takes time, I'm sure, when you first oh, yeah. start. But, um, and then when you have a small restaurant, you know, you don't have the luxury. Again, it's economics. You don't have the luxury of hiring somebody to do what you do. You have to be there. Yeah, I agree. If I go back to a show a number of years ago, Ten years ago, we were talking Brooklyn, had you on the show. You know, I would say to you, who's going to open up in Brooklyn? I could, the quote was, the guy who's going to open up in Brooklyn is a husband and wife, and they're going to put 12 seats, and that's the only type who's going to survive. Okay? That's what I said. That was, that was your comment. And so the question is, you know, like we were talking before to Bill, you know, Staten Island. By the way, he's husband and wife. I know. It. Okay. But I'm not in Brooklyn. No, but you're really in a place that nobody... You're in a place we, we're changing Long Island City to crane country. Yeah. Okay, there are more cranes going up Long in Long Island City, City than anywhere. There, I think it's a bigger site than America. There are, the there are 32,000 apartments being built in yeah. this community. Wow. Okay? And not one... There's one good restaurant, and that's you, because there's nothing in Long Island City. Okay. What was the barbecue place in Long Island City? Yeah, it's John Brown. Pearson's. There's a there's John Brown Barbecue. Oh wow. yeah, yeah, yeah. But Pearson. Pearson was, started this whole yeah. thing. Pearson kind of started coming to New York. He brought a barrel smoker in there. And by the way, fire. By, by the way, what you have to understand is he cannot set up shop anywhere because he's burning wood, which has tremendous fumes, and the communities will go ape shit. I'm sure. Excuse me. I'm I'm, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. certain they'll bleep that. But <laughs> no. <we won't. laughs> but but what do you do about that? Have you? Got yeah, I mean, plates? we 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 got a lot of national notoriety very quickly because I I demanded that if I was going to take this crazy leap into this into this world I knew very little about other than cooking good barbecue that I was going to do it authentically and for me authentically is cooking on open live fires 24 hours a day and that's what we do to this day we just figured out how to now put it into a building that's housed for it instead of just freewheeling it in the middle but how of do you do that how do you replicate that in other places. How do you replicate you that? You don't. That's why I'm well now. I'll, I'll never Island, open you're not going to be able to replicate that, okay? You know, you have the, even your places, you can't replicate the small restaurants anymore. I mean... You, the, you come up with an interesting concept that fits. You believe in it. You stick to it. The great, the great thing about Joey, if you think about this, I mean, when I was a kid growing up, um, the first restaurant I managed, I didn't own it, was 24 Fifth Avenue, right in the village on Fifth Avenue and 9th Street. And that was like a dream because the whole thing in New York was the restaurants in the village. You had the coach house. Mm -hmm. That was, you know, it's like that was the charming part of New York to go out for dinner. And so you have actually perpetuated that because there's a lot of restaurants in the village, not not a lot of good ones. Right. I mean, you know, there are Babo is obviously taken I, over for the coach house. That's pretty good. I'd but. say 10 years ago, right when Little Al was opening up, uh, there's you know, there was Anissa where I would look at Anissa's check average and say, how am I gonna make money on 10 tables? And I'm like, well, she does it, and she's a three, she was a three-star restaurant in the New York Times. I was like, I'm not a three-star chef. I'm a grandma chef, I make, I make good food, but I'm not like, you know, I'm looking for these reviews. Um, I wanna be able to manage, manage a business at a time. And I was just coming off of working with Jimmy Bradley and Danny Abrams at this monster restaurant called Pache. And so I wanted something that I could manage and still make money and, um, and, and I, one, a, a phrase that keeps coming to my mind, so if I'm going to be in the village, I want to have this feeling of like this bohemian country club, right? Where anyone, you, you know, you, I, I'm very lucky because we book 30 days out, but there are people that come up to me every day and say, 
like, I want to come in tomorrow night, four top and at eight o'clock. And I, I never say no. I say, yeah, sure. No problem. I, I pay other people to say no, but I say, <laughs> but I say no. <laughs> Joey, Joey. What, do you have a uh, rolling table to fit what extra? Well, I know what that's like now with our lines. Our lines are so long now. I have every friend that I ever grew up with for the past 44 years of my existence, at, you know, saying, hey, man, can we cut the line? Can we cut the line? Oh, cut my God. Uh, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. you know, only Drew gets to cut the line. No, because I, I, <laughs> I, 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 I tell him, let's go in the kitchen, you know. <laughs> We're right here. But this, the market table, what was the name of the guy who owned that space? Kenny Shopson. Okay, so do you know who Kenny Shopson is? Oh, yeah. So I have the, no the thing about he Hugh. He threw me out once. I was, oh, oh, yeah. Not, not me. I'm cool. <laughs> no, no. Because Hugh, and, uh, Hugh is like, I th- I, I, I'm not going to say he's like Kenny, but he has a sort of a legend behind him. But Kenny, and I never went there for this reason. He, first of all, he wouldn't take parties of five. Like, Just it, the number five. That was it. If you walked in with five, he'd throw you out. <laughs> yeah. And then... What kind of restaurant? He's right now. He's in the Essex market yeah. with some little thing, and I, I always walk in because I want him to yell at me or something. But t- tell the story. Did he really throw you out once? Yeah, I mean, I, we were just shopping uh, around because, like, I, my my wife had a um, she was partner for Heritage Heritage Food USA, and they had a little stand there. So we bought like a piece of like a piece of ham or something that they had, and we carrying the ham. Ah, we'll yeah. stop there. You at shop since, and uh, sure enough, like like. What uh, what are you doing with that? Like, are you gonna really bring your food to my restaurant? It's like, <laughs> uh, no, just like I happen to have it in my bag. Y- you know, it's like I'm gonna. It's like it's it's not gonna fucking work for you today. <laughs> you're gonna come back when you're fucking hungry, okay? It's mm. like all right, all right. Where can I go? It's like oh, so. Wait, like, like, so by the so, way, there's so, a documentary about this yeah. guy that you should see. It's because I because I had a piece of ham. Yeah. No, no. So, so he, he, here's here's the question. You know. You're still alive, and you're still always <laughs> looking at different really? opportunities. And all of you are active. Okay, you have a, how many table, how many seats do you have in your restaurant? No, I have uh, 91 seats. Yeah. 91 What's seats. The steakhouse. Are, you, are you open at lunch and dinner? No, just uh, just dinner, and I'm open three days a week. <laughs> three days a week. I told you well, he goes to the beat of his own week. drum. Yeah, <laughs> and I was like back back in the diner days. I was. Why do you think he looks? The I most wouldn't open relaxed. the weekend at night. <laughs> Anyways, uh, wait a second. He's he's working uh, seven days. Everyone. I work seven s- days. No worries. <laughs> I work. I work eight <laughs> days a okay, week. Okay, but you. But the restaurant's only three days. Three week. days. Yeah. What days? Both week? both of the restaurant? No. No, I have to. The dinette. The dinette, dinette is open along with the museum. Hours. Talk about right. the dinette because that's in a score. Dinette is very, is very uh, unusual. It's like an exhibit. It changes along with the museum. Right, it's in so the it's museum. very, very crazy. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a different thing. No one wants to go in, in so, that business. So, so here's the question with all of you, but your, it's your bill. Your businesses are they transferable? Could you go into the catering business? Okay. Okay. Ours we, is. I mean, we do. You're, we're doing that right you're, now. You're, you're in that business. I yeah, we're building that. a huge. We're doing it a lot place too. Right now the museum. Just we have no choice. Yeah, that's mostly it. One of my favorite things is catering. You know, I have a lot of, of um, lot of experience with catering from when I lived in Los Angeles and working with Waxman. Um, <clears throat> so I actually have an, an event space on Greenwich Avenue. It's called, it's called Little Al the Venue, and it's the it's the perfect space for you know the the fortieth birthday party. Because, you know, when you're 40 years old, you, you don't have that many friends. So it's not a big <laughs> catering hall. So wait a second. Right. I have a big birthday coming <laughs> up, so it depends. Uh, well, after that, yeah. Any, you know, I'm saying between 40, the 40th and the 50th birthday uh, demographic is about 25 to 30 people for, for a dinner party. So you have a small private venue. Private event space. Private yeah. event it's a space. private room, which is a storefront on Greenwich Avenue which um, we spend a lot of time understanding the value of reciprocation. So for instance, um, <clears throat> if you're my client, your guests are my staff's clients. And that's how we speak and that's how we treat. So that person, number one, is gonna be in a room, storefront on Greenwich Avenue, looking out onto the AIDS Research Memorial in a transforming neighborhood. It's bustling, there's lots of foot traffic and everybody wants in but they can't because it's private. And so as a guest, I feel, I feel a little privileged and I'm thankful to my host for inviting me. Mm. So we play on that as much as we possibly can and, and provide. And that's where he puts the extra people at eight o'clock for the day. <laughs> <laughs> that's where it's four times. Can, can I also point out, Michael, that this, their restaurants are really have extraordinary food. 
I mean, they're really known for something. For instance, I read all the stuff about hometown. I didn't know Billy. And I, I just said, all right, if it's as good as they say it is, and it's rare that I go to a place and the proof's in the pudding. This guy is making, he has a live trout tank in his kitchen. Mm. Who does that anymore? And he's, are you, he does are a you great making gefilte fish with, <laughs> <laughs> with a trout. And okay, the, old, bleu, the yeah. grandma. <laughs> so you're putting the kill. No, it's a trout au bleu. It's the yeah, famous yeah. dish. And this guy makes uh, everything. He, t- he makes it good, but the kitchen is small, so you know he has to think about the logistics. So he pan sears a beautiful chicken and the pasta. I mean, so the, the, really, at the end of the day, what makes a great restaurant is the food. What draws people is the adventure. So it's an adventure to go to their restaurants. But isn't it also, besides an adventure, and we, we alluded it before, <laughs> it's the personality of, Six the, years. Uh, of the owner, okay? I think- That's important. Okay, that's very important, okay? You know, even though there are lines, people know the pit master, the owner, and your partners are there, you're on base. The same thing. People, you know, as I said to you before, one of my friends, his wife's 40th birthday is coming up, they love it. They're having it in the private room. They want to be there because it's your personality. The same thing with you. You know, you're over there. Maybe it's your wife, really, that makes the <laughs> restaurant better. You know, the restaurant better. No, maybe. No, oh, the she's fish. A, she's the a, fish she's thinks from the head. The fish thinks. Of her Remember head. that. Yeah. But, oh, and they want to see us. They want to see us. Want, yeah, I mean, when I'm in when I'm in New York, which is you know when I'm not traveling, cooking somewhere else these days, I tap every table every night. I mean, every single table every night. At the end of the day, we're all very aware, and I'm, I'm, I don't put myself in that category at all, but at the end of the day, New Yorkers that we're serving work extremely hard for their dollars, and you know, I know I could speak for him too, because I've been a guest at his restaurant, um, or I've eaten at his restaurant. Like You feel good going away, spending your hard dollars, knowing that it's going to a husband and wife, or it's going to someone who really, really cares about you. You know, the, the comment a number of years ago that I learned from my buddy over here was besides touching the tables and other <clears throat> items, he said, it's not only New Yorkers, it's people who are the visitors from the world who want to come to New York. When you come to New York, you're looking at your restaurant. People will find out, even though it's three days a week, okay? There are people moving to Long Island City. People do go to Astoria. They've, they've learned about Astoria. Astoria has been yeah, over there. One day, definitely. Jersey City might be the opportunity, depending on where the market is. But it, it's people from around the world come to New York. When they come to the theater... I've done shows on the theater, and the, the guys, all the theater owners said people spend, they save their money to come to spend the money in the theater. They, people who visit New York do the same thing. They save their money to go to your steakhouse. Hey, no offense, they could go to the Palm. It's going to the Palm. It's not, it's a different thing. People go to yours. Okay, they can go to a different barbecue or Definitely. place. You know, or, or they can go to, you know, Batard is a, a unique place. Okay, Tribeca or Nobu. It's a, it's a unique place that people want to go to. Experience. You know, it's, it's the experience. So how do you grow in this business today? Can you replicate, you know, your locations are all within an area nearby, so you're able to be... <laughs> I don't know if I can have... <clears throat> Uh, another restaurant in Greenwich Village, but um, I do think that there's there's um, a need for another event space, and I think I can grow my business that way. Um, if I were to make another Little Owl, it would it would have to be much more calculated. Uh, and to Drew's point, it has to be the brand. It has to be the name. It, it can't be little owl spelled backwards. People are going to want the little owl. That's what they want. Mm-hmm. For me, it's where you know we're in the process of opening a, um, a building, a six thousand square foot commissary space, uh, so state of the art kitchen with a two hundred seat event dining hall for because people want to buy out hometown daily. You know, all, you know, because they like that rustic aesthetic and stuff like that. So we're essentially designing the same building off site um, in Industry City. Uh, in Sunset Park, in, in a, which was once a fully Latino area. We're in the building where they made Topps baseball cards now. So Whoa. very cool history to the building. So you're moving into Industry City? Not the restaurant, but our catering event and commissary space is 6,000 square feet, 200-seat uh, catering event space. And on the other side, um, I agree completely with the name. 
hundred percent. We're opening up a 35 seat home, uh, fried chicken restaurant. That's, you know, from raw and cast iron. Um, but we're calling it hometown pan fried chicken. Um, and you have to stay on brand. I completely agree. A hundred percent. It's brand and the personalities. I think it's definitely, it's, yeah. the, it's the combination. So what about, I, th I think there's a matter of so of sensibility of the place. I mean, I moved from Montreal to New York. It happened very quickly to me here. Like the success came very, uh, almost too quickly. This is a little <clears> crazy. But I think it's a sensibility to the place. I, I feel like I can move, like I, I can adapt. I can do all sorts of things. I don't have to to take my brand and to, to force it and do someone's uh But that someone people else. come to you and propose the opportunity? Oh, I have a lot of opportunity yeah. and stuff. I want to do, I mean, I'm, I'm pleased. I'm You're pleased creative. to do what I want, yeah. you know. I've, I've been like very I mean, blessed here in a, New York. There's a new office complex being built in Long Island City yeah. not far from you. But this you, is, you, yeah. It's 800,000 square feet. Uh, with WeWork, who I, ha you know, we were discussing WeWork, We Live, okay, then major residential developments over there, and there's no good restaurants to speak of in the area. There's no restaurant, but there's nothing. And, like, I, I don't believe that you need only people to, to fill restaurants. You need businesses. You need things, you place to shop. You need hardware store. You need, like, you know, more good restaurants no, would you, be you, good. You're 100% you're, you're no. correct. The biggest problem about Long Island City, it's under-retailed. It's under retail in general. Yeah. It's, it's not only restaurants. They don't have enough retail. I mean, my joke is you want to go shopping, you got to go to Costco. Okay. Right. You know, I have, yeah, and it's I have my store, warehouse yeah, there know. for um, but you know for Crush, but right. it's a warehouse. We don't do it. It's, it's yeah, a it's a dorm. Like Long Island City is a giant dorm right now where people enjoy the easy commute to Manhattan and they have a little family and stuff. They can they have doggy daycares every corner, and it's about that. <laughs> but it is, uh, you know, I'm first and foremost a destination. People come, that's why the three days. It's not because I want to be eccentric or what. Because it makes sense for us. Because so uh, like a day that's very bad on the Monday where like the neighborhood is not around, uh, uh, it, it hurts. But I can do all sorts of events. And that's why, like that's, that's how the, the, the catering aspect come into, uh, into play. All these other days I can throw party the way I want and get like... Uh, what's, your, what's your average check? Uh, 110 per, about pers per person. And Joey? I'm in the high 60s. I think ours is 38. Depends if he comes in, because the half a pound minimum goes to a, ma a pound. Yeah, and he, you know, he gets he gets two checks, one for him, one for his driver. <laughs> That's right, exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, as I was alluding, there's an opportunity in the Bronx or up in Jersey City. Or, you know, these absolutely these, these I, I gentrify. I mean, you you learn from Philadelphia. You don't always do well in the in the suburbs. Uh, no, I. Um, I think for Manhattan, um, a, a neighborhood for young restaurateurs uh, to to dive into entrepreneurship in the hospitality industry might be uh, Alphabet City. That's where I would look. And, you know, when I was a kid growing up, because I grew up in that area, just to walk across 14th Street, you were taking your life in your hands. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm and I'm born and raised in Brooklyn, so I would say where Industry City is in that surrounding areas of Sunset Park, that beautiful, That's growing. That's that beautiful growing. Latino community is is growing. Really? Wow. And, the, the and I'm hoping that doesn't change. I'm hoping that they because they have a lot to say as far as food's concerned. Right. And I I hope that more uh, interesting businesses and restaurants grow on there. But but, if, but restaurants grow by gentrification of neighborhoods also. Yeah, but there, there's no that's true. That. That's definitely true, and that's that's I'm a I'm a reason even for my success. Even, even take Greenwich, uh, Greenwich. Yeah, I mean we, we we fit all of us. We fit into um, a, a a community culture, and if you you take bits and pieces of that culture out and move it, then the whole the, the equation fails. See, Tribeca at the beginning, they didn't want us there. Gentrification was a dirty word. Right. Uh, now it's become a better word. So. All in all, once again, the co-host and the executive producer <laughs> has outdid himself by bringing a great group. Hopefully, you'll all be back on this and even on my other sh on my life story show. I'd like to thank you, Joey, Bill. Honored to be here. And needless to say, thank you, Drew. Michael. See you next week. Thank you. Take care.